Good morning, everyone, and welcome for, uh, to the Restore live stream. It's great to have you with us. Um, uh, we are just at the end of a week of prayer and fasting, uh, which has been a really great time, actually. Um, I never in some ways enjoy a week of prayer and fasting, partly because I have to give up things that I naturally uh, would enjoy doing, like food, um, and uh, have to get up early for the 6 a.m. Uh, prayer meetings. But having said all of that, um, I really enjoy the weeks of prayer and fasting because they're moments where I uh, uh, create a bit more space in my life to hear from God. And they're moments that, uh, that in my mind and heart and spirit, I'm just able to pray over some things and, uh, and hopefully get a bit more clarity. And, and uh, that's what I find I get from weeks of prayer and fasting, which is why we do them twice a year. We do them every January and every September. And because we're at the start of a new season, as it feels like, uh, then it's helpful to uh, be listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying. It feels particularly important to us this year because we're obviously coming up to Restore's 40th anniversary. That's uh, uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, we're going to be celebrating that. Do come along and join us if you possibly can. Um, in the Bible, 40 is a really significant number. I think 137 times in the uh, Bible, it talks about the number 40. And in many ways, it represents a changing of a season or a transition. Israel wandered 40 years in the wilderness, um, and then it was time to enter into the promised land. And it's almost like we finished, uh, or we're coming to the end of one complete season for Restore and about to step into something new. And in moments of transition, it's really important that we tune into what the Holy Spirit is saying, and we're alert to where God wants to lead us for the next season. So we've been spending time over this month revisiting uh, the uh, vision for Restore overall, but also some of the key things that God has spoken over us as a church. Because again, if we, if we refocus on those, it hopefully will mean that we're on target as we step into this next season. We're going to spend some time thanking God on Saturday. We're going to spend plenty of time uh, worshipping and celebrating and, uh, and really um, thanking Jesus for all that he's done through the life of his church over the last 40 years, because it is his work, not ours. And uh, he's the head of the church. But also we're going to be in the evening spending some time praying over the next season and the next 40 years. So as I say, if you are able to join us, that would be great. Um, you will know if you have been joining in the last few weeks or if you joined in Restore over the last few years. You know that our vision comes from Isaiah 61. And uh, Jesus at the very start of his ministry, when he uh, declares what he's come to do, he quotes from Isaiah 61. And we've been looking at those verses over the last few weeks. And I'm going to going to continue that journey uh, today. So I'll just read them again. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It says this, uh, Jesus quotes, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And we've been looking through these weeks, we've been looking at, uh, at, at the first week, we were looking at the fact that Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. And God's spirit is at work in our lives to enable us to fulfill what Jesus has called us to. So we want to be people of the spirit. A week of prayer and fasting is about laying down some things that we would use to feed our flesh so that we can more tune in to the Spirit of God. And hopefully that's what we've been doing over this last week or so. Then we were looking about the fact that we're called to be good news people. And uh, good news people are people that are declaring the goodness of God, people that are releasing the kingdom of heaven and everything that heaven, that we can imagine heaven is like, that we can be people who release that on the earth right now. We know lots of people are experiencing hell on earth, literally. It feels like hell on earth. And we want to be bringing the good news of Jesus into it. We want to be bringing the good news of hope. We want to be bringing the good news of transformation. But then this passage goes on and it talks about literally what transformation looks like. It talks about he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. We could kind of do with that at the moment, couldn't we? Because our prisons are running out of space. Um, but then we need a transformed people if we're going to release them from prison. Um, so I'm not making a political statement in that. It was just a, a, a cheap joke. But um, we do, for many of us, we're locked in prisons of, of sin, uh, prisons of addiction, of hopelessness. And Jesus says, I've come to set those prisoners free. He then goes on and talks about recovery of sight to the blind, um, which I think is, is, is insight. 
Um, sometimes we talk about the blind leading the blind. Jesus talked about that in terms of the Pharisees. Um, because although they were meant to be people who were meant to have insight and bring a godly perspective, they'd lost that. And so for some of us, we need a revelation so we can see the way that life is meant to be, so we can see the reality of who God is, we can see the reality of how he wants us to live, and we know that Jesus literally healed a number of blind people because uh, Jesus came as a healer of the sick because sickness wasn't God's original design for mankind. It was our brokenness and our fallenness and our sin and our rebellion that opened a gateway to um, sickness. And then he goes on and talks about setting the oppressed free. But I want to bring us back to the last verse in this, really, because Jesus then says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's a great um, sentence, isn't it? Just to have spoken over you, this year is a year of the Lord's favor. And uh, it, just to hear somebody saying, sometimes we talk, we say, don't we, God bless you. But the blessing of God, the favor of God, is a very powerful thing. And Jesus declares right at the beginning of his, his uh, ministry, he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And uh, what I want to do today is unpack what that really means. Because the reality is, in the Old Testament, when uh, God uh, drew his people out from the other nations and created from Abraham the nation of Israel, his uh, purpose for the nation of Israel is they would live in unity with him. And as they lived in unity with him, they would live out what a godly lifestyle looks like. And the, the hope was they would be, literally it says in the Old Testament, a light to the nations. In other words, the other nations would see the goodness of Israel. They would see why living in God's world, God's way, makes sense. They would see the favor and the prosperity of Israel. And other nations would say, we need to be like that. And because of that, there would be uh, like a drawing of other nations to say, what are Israel doing that would ultimately be a drawing back to worshiping the God of Israel? And there were a number of things that God uh, declared um, for the nation of Israel in terms of how they should live that would demonstrate the, the goodness of God and the wisdom of God. And one of the things that they uh, put into, this, uh, into the laws for Israel in Leviticus chapter 25 was teaching about the year of Jubilee. And, and the year of Jubilee was meant to be practiced every 50 years in the life of Israel. And you know, uh, part of the way that God instructed us to live was with a Sabbath. And uh, the whole point of that written into creation was that we would have a day of rest each week. So we'd have a day that we uh, let go, lay down our regular activity, and it would be a day that we could worship God and focus on God. It would be a day that we could physically rest, spiritually rest. We could maybe process some of the stuff from the week. We could invest in a good way, in a loving way, into the key relationships in our lives. And uh, we could make sure that we're living in a, in a good place, a place of, of unity with God, so that then the rest of our week would function well out of that. And actually, scientists have demonstrated that people who practice a Sabbath every week uh, uh, generally are healthier and achieve more than people who work seven days a week, which is interesting because with the internet and advent in technology and that sort of thing, many of us end up working pretty much 24-7, seven, seven days a week. And uh, we're wondering why uh, society is burnt out and people are feeling so stressed. I think it's because we've, uh, we've stopped living according to God's rhythm and God's uh, intention and God's wisdom. And so uh, uh, God's original intention was every seven days we would have a day of rest. Written within the um, uh, calendar for Israel would be every seven years you would have a year that you wouldn't farm the, uh, the ground. You'd, you'd have a Sabbath year. And uh, we know uh, from uh, farming that actually uh, land is more productive if you have periods that are fallow. And so every seven years they were to leave the land fallow and then it would be able to replenish itself. And again, it's just a godly wisdom for it. But then every uh, seventh Sabbath, every seventh seven, after 49 years, you'd have a Sabbath year. And then at the 50th year, you would have a, a bonus, an extra Sabbath year. And that extra Sabbath year was called a year of Jubilee. And the plan for the year of Jubilee was that debts would be forgiven, slaves would be set free, and everybody would re be returned to their original inheritance. And the thing with God is God loves each of us uniquely and equally. 
And so uh, we're all different from one another, but we're equally loved by our Heavenly Dad. Whatever we might feel about ourselves, we are equally loved by our Heavenly Dad, who uniquely made us. And uh, when uh, Israel was invited to take hold of the Promised Land, God's plan was that everybody within the nation of Israel would have a portion of land within the Promised Land. And it would be their portion of land for them and for their family. And their portion of land to farm um, to be able to enjoy the goodness of God. But God understood that over time, some people would just be really good at farming the land, just to have a, have a, a an, on, maybe entrepreneurial gift. And they would be so good at making money and developing things, they would end up expanding their land. And other people, they wouldn't be so good at farming their land. And so they, were, they would, over the course of 50 years, fall on hard times. And they maybe would end up selling their land to pay off other debts or that kind of thing. And for some people, there would be heartbreak, trauma, um, and maybe some sickness that would mean they would end up losing their land. And uh, in the time of ancient Israel, you know, there was no kind of government uh, support or, or uh, <coughs> not the welfare kind of system that we have these days. And so if people fell on hard times, they would uh, sell their labor to other people. And so they'd become, if you like, uh, slaves. And the way it worked is uh, uh, they would sell their labor for a certain number of years, and they would sell their labor up until the Jubilee year, because at the Jubilee year, there would be a trumpet that sounded through the land. And uh, when that trumpet sounded, it would declare, this is the year of Jubilee, and every person that had sold themselves into slavery would be released. Every person that had lost some land would get the land back. All the people that had prospered and, and grown and developed more land, they would give it back to people. And the plan was it would be a year of celebration where everybody is able to rejoice in the fact that we are equally and uniquely loved by God. And we're back in that place that we all know that we're loved by God. And it would also put compassion in, at the heart of the Israelite society, just as God is love. And, and God is therefore a compassionate love. And again, we see that in Jesus. Um, it would be an expression of, uh, of God's love and care that, that the wealthy would be generous and give back to people who'd had their inheritance lost. And there would be a restoration in it. So it would literally be the year of the Lord's favor. Now, a sad fact in the history of the nation of Israel is they never once practiced a full jubilee. And, uh, and that is sad. Um, maybe it's not um, surprising because the reality is, isn't it, if we live apart from carrying the heart of God, when we get more, we tend to just want more. And uh, we tend to, um, when we're living for me and for myself, if I've got something, I'm going to hold on to it because my security becomes that thing or my bank balance, or my possession, or what I own, as opposed to God. And it takes trust and generosity to release inheritance back to others, to give away what I feel like I've earned. But actually, that's the heart of God, isn't it? For God so loved that he gave the best thing he, was, he had, which was Jesus. Jesus was willing to give and lay down all that he was for us. And so God's heart was that we would carry that. So every 50 years, we would be generous and compassionate and caring and particularly have a heart for the poor and the vulnerable. And we would do our part to bring restoration and release to them. And as I say, Israel uh, never really uh, lived as a nation the way that God intended them to. So they never practiced a full jubilee. When Jesus comes, because Jesus comes to fulfill all of the Old Testament, he says that in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5. He says, I didn't come to, uh, to kind of replace. He, he said, I came to fulfill. And so all the teaching of the Old Testament we see uh, being fulfilled in Jesus. The Bible is, is a complete story from beginning to end. And Jesus is what it all points towards. And so Jesus comes as the fulfillment of Jubilee. And when he stands in a synagogue and he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. I've come to bring again the compassion, the love of God, which is why Jesus always, always started with the vulnerable and the marginalized and the rejected, because he was demonstrating the compassion and the heart and the love of God. 
And then he goes on, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. In other words, those of us that are trapped in patterns of behavior and sin and addiction and, and, and all of that kind of stuff, Jesus comes and he says, I've come to break that power of sin over your life. I've come to break that addiction. I've come as God to set you free. Recovery of sight to the blind. I've come to bring healing. I've come to bring revelation. I've come to bring insight and to set the oppressed free. You will know a sense of freedom being declared over your life because the year of the Lord's favour has come. And so Isaiah 61 is really a declaration of jubilee. And when Isaiah prophesied it to the nation of Israel, it was actually when Israel was about uh, to go into exile and come under judgment and lose the promised land and come under oppression of other nations. And God says, even though you've strayed away from me, I still love you and I'm going to lead you to a place where you can be reunited, where you can rediscover the favour of God. And Jesus picks up those verses because that's what Jesus came from heaven to do. He came to pay the price for all of our rebellion, all of our sin, everything we've done wrong. That's why he hung on a cross, not because he'd done anything wrong, but he paid the price for us as the ultimate year of jubilee. You know, Jesus' last cry from the cross is, it is finished, the price has been paid, the, uh, the, uh, the debt, when we're in debt to God, because of the way that we've fallen short, the debt's been paid by me, you can be forgiven, no longer will you be a slave to sin, you can know the freedom that God brings over your heart, mind, uh, life, and that you can know the favour of God. And a few years ago, when we were thinking about this, God really spoke to me about uh, what it means to declare the favour of God and the blessing of God. And if you like a jubilee year, you know, normally when we think about the jubilee in the UK, we think about a monarch's reign. And after a certain number of years, you have a jubilee year, which is uh, celebrating the reign of the monarch. But uh, that's all based around the original uh, jubilee teaching which is, is celebrating the reign of God and the reign of Jesus and the goodness of God and the goodness of Jesus. But um, I was a few years ago just thinking, what does it mean for us to sound the jubilee? What would it mean for us to herald the jubilee? And in Israel, they used to, the plan was they'd have a trumpet blast and the trumpet blast would signal the jubilee. And when I was reading about that and thinking about that, one of the things I came across was uh, in America, in Philadelphia, they had, uh, well, still have, actually, what was called the Jubilee Bell. And uh, as uh, they uh, achieved independence as a nation in 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was first read out publicly in Pennsylvania, they rang all the bells in the land to declare freedom. And there was this one bell in Philadelphia, and it had written on it Leviticus 25.10, a verse from the Old Testament, but a verse about Jubilee. And, uh, and literally inscribed on the bell was, proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all of the inhabitants thereof. And so when uh, independence was declared, all the bells were rung to ring out jubilee, to ring out freedom, to ring out liberty. And then as I started to study it a little bit more, um, I realized that the Liberty Bell in, in Philadelphia, you can still see it, it's actually got a crack in uh, uh, now. They reckon it was rung so much over its first 90 years, ultimately it cracked. But the Liberty Bell was actually made by the uh, Whitechapel Bell Foundry. So it was a British bell, a bit ironic that a British bell was rung out for freedom from, from the Brits. But they got hold of the fact that God wants to bring us into a place of freedom. And when independence was declared, they rang freedom out across the land. Now, it was interesting because on from that, um, one of the things that happened is there were a number of abolitionist groups that arose um, that wanted to um, abolish slavery, and quite rightly so, because if you're going to ring out freedom across the land, and Jubilee is meant to be slave set free, then obviously part of that is we should release slaves. And uh, one of the uh, groups that was anti-slavery and uh, for uh, um, the abolition of slavery, they set up a regular publication that they used to send out, and they called it the Liberty Bell, because they were praying for freedom. And probably the most famous preach speech 
of the uh, 20th century. I call it a, 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 a preach because it was a preach rather than a speech, was uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream preach. And, uh, and it, it, it's actually a fascinating story. I've, and I love the whole civil rights movement in the States because it was a moment that the church was mobilized to change society. And uh, that change is still being outworked in the States and we need to pray for it to continue. But uh, Martin Luther King was a prophetic voice in terms of rise, raising up the church to take a stance, to shift inequality and, uh, and, uh, and a racist uh, system. But uh, uh, the story goes that uh, in, when Martin Luther King was uh, speaking in 1963, um, he was uh, speaking and his uh, talk wasn't actually going very well. He'd, he'd, he'd pre-prepared a talk a bit like I have here and he was sticking to script and it was safe and it was good, but it wasn't great. And sitting behind him was the gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. And uh, she had heard him preach before. And she'd heard him preach about his dream for America. And she could feel that he wasn't doing well. She could feel that he was struggling. She could feel there was something more that needed to be released. And so behind him, she said, tell him, tell him about your dream, Martin. Tell him about your dream. And he stopped and went off script and delivered the greatest preach of the 20th century. And in that preach, he talked about a dream. And in the midst of that preach, he said, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we let freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we'll be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. And if you track it through, all that I've been saying, Martin Luther King declared through his I Have a Dream preach that the year of Jubilee was coming across America, that the year of Jubilee was coming for every black person within America. The year of Jubilee was coming, and he declared it. And I think we heard something in the spirit, which is why it's had such a resonance down through the years. But you know, as God's people, God has anointed us by his spirit to declare the jubilee, to declare an end to injustice, to declare an end to slavery, to declare an end to the abuse of the poor, to declare the coming of the kingdom of God. And a few years ago when I preached this, um, somebody went and they bought me a bell. And they said, well, Ian, if we're called to ring out the jubilee, let's ring it out. And, uh, and uh, so I got this bell and uh, we uh, uh, inscribed it with Isaiah 61. And on a Sunday morning in Loughton, we rang it and we rang it with a, with a declaration that as a church, we were going to ring out jubilee for this land. We we're going to ring out jubilee for this community. We were going to ring out uh, the God who's come to set the captives free, to bring a recovery of sight to the blind, to bring good news to the poor. Are we going to ring out the jubilee? And we did it one Sunday. <laughs> Apologies for what that's doing for your sound and your TV. Um, but then people said to me, can I borrow the bell and ring it out in different situations? And we went it out, we actually offered it for a year, and we let different people, where they felt God had called them to make a change, take the bell and ring it there. And for some people, they took it to their homes, and they rang it in their homes, and they prayed that God would bring about supernatural change and transformation. We had somebody and they were working for that period at the BBC and they went and they rang the bell in the corridors of the BBC. And over the next couple of months, the whole Jimmy Savile um, scandal broke out and uh, they wondered if their ringing the bell had been part of exposing something that was bringing release and freedom 
to the victims of abuse. We had someone else and they took a group of our young people and it was the time that, uh, that the Archbishop of Canterbury was about to be selected, the next Archbishop of Canterbury. And they went into the grounds of Lambeth Palace and they rang out the Jubilee Bell. And uh, we ended up with Justin Welby being appointed the Archbishop of Canterbury, a spirit-filled Jesus believer, um, being put in what has turned out to be a really significant role at a significant time. And we had story after story after story of that. There's a head teacher, and they borrowed our Jubilee Bell and at, at their school um, in those days. Uh, they still used to mark uh, the end of playtime by ringing a bell. So instead of using the school bell, he took our Jubilee Bell and he rang it in the playground <laughs> as a declaration that we were going to see the kingdom of God released into that area. And I wonder whether as we come into the end of our fourth, first 40 years, and we're about to step into our next 40 years as a church, I think God wants us to pick up the bell, to pick up the anointing for releasing Jubilee. I think God wants us maybe to take our stand again, to say, we're going to be part of a people that are going to demonstrate the goodness of God and the compassion of God and the love of God. And we're going to be mobilised to bring a change in society. We're going to stand against injustice. We're going to stand against oppression. We're going to do our bit to see the goodness of God released. And um, I don't know how we're going to get this to you. Um, maybe you can email me and ask if you can borrow it. Um, but we're going to get a bell for each and every one of our congregations, um, just as a prophetic sign, really, to say, we're called to ring out the year of the Lord's favour. And if over this next season, if you would like to borrow this bell um, so that you can uh, take hold of it, pray into a particular circumstance, particular situation, maybe you work in a school, maybe in your workplace, maybe in your home, maybe in your street, obviously at an appropriate time, um, if you're going to ring it, um, maybe you want to take hold of this just as a part of saying, God, in this next season, I'm going to stand for you and I'm going to declare, I'm going to be part of making a change. And obviously we, we make a change firstly by praying it and then secondly by acting on the back of our prayers. And so we're taking a stance when we ring the bell to pray something in and then we can ask God to open up the avenue whereby we can then engage in bringing the change. What would it mean for you if Jesus rang a jubilee over your life? If Jesus said, now is the year of the Lord's favour, what would that look like? Is there a bondage you need breaking? Is there a, a pattern of sin behaviour you need breaking? Is there a relationship you need a shift in? Is there something that you need releasing for this next season? But also, where does God want to use you to release Jubilee, his favour and his love. And wouldn't it be great if we all took a stand as we step into this next season as we saw, if we all took a stand to release the goodness of God into our community and into our world. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to release you to go and uh, ring out the Jubilee somewhere. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that... This passage is all about understanding the fullness of who you are and the fullness of what you came to earth to do. And Lord, I think in this season, Lord, you're wanting to bring us back to our first love in terms of you, but also to prioritising again the things you've called us to. And Lord, I know in that season in the past when you spoke to us about wringing out freedom, Lord, I know that something shifted I think over this nation, but something shifted for a number of us in our lives, in our context, in our situations. And Lord, I believe that wasn't a one-off because, Jesus, you came as the fulfilment of Jubilee. So in you, Jubilee is ringing continually. And Lord, today, Lord, we want to pick up the Jubilee bell, Lord. We want to pick up, we want to, uh, Lord, tune in to the, the sound of God's favour that you're releasing afresh over our lives Father, where some of us are trapped in slavery, where some of us, Father, have been the victims of injustice, where some of us have had our inheritance robbed from us. Father, we declare an end to that today in Jesus' name. 
we say no more in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, where you've called us now to be the light of the world, Lord, may we be those who ring out the coming of the kingdom of God, who declare the coming of the kingdom of God in our community, in our homes, over our families, in our workspaces, over our kids, over the next generation. May we be the ones who ring out the sound of freedom. Let freedom ring over the UK. Let freedom ring over this nation. Let freedom ring. May your people rise up and ring out the sound of liberty and freedom in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for joining with us today. Obviously, if you've got a bell in your house, you don't need to borrow mine. You can just go and ring that out. I don't think it particularly matters which bell we use, uh, but if it would help you, um, then we'd very happily uh, give you the use of a bell to ring out wherever you are. If you don't know what else to do, email me, ian.king at restorecc.org.uk. We'll connect you to a bell that you can ring at. But over this season, let's be expectant that we experience ourselves, but also we carry um, the year of God's favour, the blessing of God. And let's ring that out. Let's pray it out into our community and across our lives. Look forward to seeing you. Hopefully you can join us on Saturday. It'd be great to have you at our 40th celebration. If not, join with me next Sunday and we'll be back for the last part of our vision series uh, this September. God bless you. Have a great week. See you next week.